Both New Hampshire and Vermont are two small northeastern states which share many geographical similarities, especially physically. However, in terms of human geography, there are some notable differences. Let's compare both states in this month's State Comparison Series episode. The Northeastern United States is home to lots of the United States' colonial history. However, New Hampshire and Vermont have varying histories associated with it. New Hampshire was one of the 13 colonies and has a rich history shaped by Native American settlements, early European exploration, and colonial development. It played a pivotal role in the American Revolution with events like the Pine Tree Riot and the Battle of Bennington. On June 21, 1788, New Hampshire was admitted into the Union as the ninth state. The state's commitment to individual rights was evident in its early adoption of the U.S. Constitution. In the 19th century, industrialization fueled economic growth, and New Hampshire became known for its textile and manufacturing industries. The 20th century brought political prominence through the influential New Hampshire primary. Today, the state is celebrated for its scenic beauty and continues to embody a spirit of independence. Vermont's history is marked by its early Native American inhabitants, followed by French and British colonial influences. In 1791, it became the 14th state to join the United States, being the first state admitted which wasn't one of the original colonies. Vermont played a key role in the American Revolution, and its commitment to abolitionism was evident in its constitution, making it the first state to prohibit slavery. The 19th century saw agricultural and industrial growth, while the 20th century brought cultural and environmental movements. Today, Vermont is known for its charming landscapes, progressive values, and a strong sense of community. In today's State Comparison Series episode, we are going to compare New Hampshire and Vermont. The video will focus on both physical and human geography. In terms of physical geography, we will review three main factors, geomorphology, meteorology, and ecology. While with human geography, we will review four main factors, demography, urbanization, economy, and geopolitics. Before we begin, make sure you subscribe to my channel, Our World, Our Planet, Our Home, if you enjoy learning about geography and earth science. Let's get started. Let's start with the geomorphology. Both states have similar landscapes, with some moderately high mountains and rolling hills. New Hampshire does have a coastline with the Atlantic Ocean, but it's only 15 miles long. This coastal area is relatively low-lying and home to many mouths of rivers and estuaries. Much of the southern part of the state has a mixture of flat areas and rolling hills, but no real high mountains. But, going further north and west, New Hampshire's topography begins to change as the state becomes increasingly higher in elevation. Towards the northern quarter of the state, is the White Mountain National Forest, which features significant elevations and the highest peak, Mount Washington, at 6,288 feet. Geologically, the White Mountains are a mixture of different rock types with prominent magma intrusions made up of granitic rock that formed more than 100 million years ago. Westward, Vermont is a landlocked state with no coastline except for the shores of Lake Champlain where the lowest elevations are found. Most of the state has a combination of rolling hills, mountains, and valleys. The most prominent mountain range is the Green Mountains, which runs from south to north through the state. In the northern part of the mountain range are the highest peaks, with Mount Mansfield being the tallest at 4,395 feet. Other notable 4,000 feet peaks include Killington Peak, Camel's Hump, Mount Ellen, and Mount Abraham. Meteorologically, both New Hampshire and Vermont are very similar, in that they both share humid continental climates, with warm to hot and sometimes humid summers, and cold winters with snow. Being more coastal, New Hampshire, especially lower areas around the ocean, are a bit milder with some marine influence. During the winter, some of these coastal areas may receive rain, while inland areas and higher areas may see snow. Of course, this is dependent on storm tracks, and a track of a nor'easter more offshore can give all of New Hampshire copious amounts of snow. During the Atlantic hurricane season, coastal New Hampshire can sometimes be affected directly or by the remnants of tropical cyclones. Further north and west, the
the more elevated areas see more extreme winters. Mount Washington sees very erratic weather throughout the year, thanks to a combination of factors such as convergence of warm and cold air masses, its elevation, and jet stream influences. The highest non-cyclonic wind speed of 234 miles an hour was recorded on the peak of the mountain on April 12, 1934. Vermont, being more inland, is colder than New Hampshire, especially during the winter months. But this is also dependent on location. Southern parts of Vermont have winters similar to interior cities in Massachusetts, Connecticut, and New York. Also, Burlington, the largest city in Vermont, sees a very slight marine influence from Lake Champlain, so winters are a tad milder. But, in the higher northern areas of the state, winters can be brutally cold and prolonged with abundant amounts of snow. During the summer, Vermont is warm, but less so than other northeastern states to the south. During the hurricane season, Vermont can be indirectly affected by the remnants of these storms. During 2011's Hurricane Irene, much of the state received massive amounts of rain, creating severe and damaging flooding. The ecology of both New Hampshire and Vermont is very alike, in that both states share very similar temperate biomes. Much of New Hampshire is covered by dense deciduous and coniferous forest. Southern parts of New Hampshire are characterized by mixed deciduous forest and coastal wetlands. Trees here include oak, hickory, and various other hardwood species. In the higher northern part of the state, forests are more mixed and include many coniferous species, like red spruce, balsam fir, and white pine. These forests are adapted to colder and more extreme conditions. Some of the really high elevated areas, such as Mount Washington, are above the alpine zone, meaning that limited growth occurs here. In terms of animals, New Hampshire is home to many mammalian species, which include white-tailed deer, black bear, coyote, red fox, and rodent species such as squirrels and chipmunks. Near the Canadian border, eastern moose are also present, and large males can weigh as much as 1,400 pounds. Near the coast, many aquatic mammalian, seabird, fish, reptile, and amphibian species make their homes there. Vermont is quite alike to New Hampshire with fauna and flora, but there are some slight differences. For one, since Vermont has a lower population than New Hampshire, the state has more forested lands, especially in the northern part of the state. One very remote forested region is known as the Northeast Kingdom. This region is characterized by its stunning natural beauty, including rolling hills, dense forests, pristine lakes, and charming rural landscapes, and features many of the same types of trees and animals as New Hampshire. The sugar maple tree is an important tree to Vermont, as it supplies maple syrup, a well-known cultural distinction of the state. And, like Mount Washington, Mount Mansfield and other high peaks are in the alpine zone and don't see too much in the way of plant growth. Now let's switch to the human geographical attributes of New Hampshire and Vermont, starting with demography. Both states are racially homogenous with large white populations. As of 2020, New Hampshire has a total population of 1,377,529 residents and has seen a 4.5% increase since 2010. Whites make up nearly 93% of the population, while Hispanics are a large minority group with 4.4%. Much of the state's population is located within 50 miles of the Massachusetts border, and some extreme southern communities are suburbs of Boston. In this area, many European ethnic groups are found, including Irish, English, and Italians. Throughout the state, and especially in the remote north, French and French Canadians make up around 23% of the population, the highest of any state. Heading to Vermont, the state has a 2020 population of 643,085 residents, making it the second smallest state only ahead of Wyoming. In addition, Vermont is one of the least diverse states in the U.S., as 94% of the population is racially white, only behind Maine, which has 94.4%. The largest minority group is Hispanics at 2.2%. Ethnically, French and French Canadians make up the largest group with 20% of the population, while other European ethnic groups include Irish and English. In recent years, both New Hampshire and Vermont have started seeing a slow diversification of their demographics, just like the rest of the United States.
Urbanization patterns within both New Hampshire and Vermont have parallels, but also mark contrasts. As said before, much of the population in New Hampshire lives within 50 miles of Massachusetts, and this is where most of the largest communities are located. Manchester is the largest city in the state with nearly 116,000 residents, while Nashua is second with 86,000 residents. Both cities are part of the Boston metropolitan area. Concord, the capital city, is third in population, and rounding out the top five most populated communities are Derry and Dover. All of the top five populated communities are located within the southern part of the state. New Hampshire has a small but well-connected highway system. I-95, a major interstate that runs from the Canadian border in Maine to Miami, Florida, goes through the state along the immediate coast and gives convenient access to Boston and Portland, Maine. I-93 runs centrally through New Hampshire and connects to I-89, which goes to Vermont, and I-91, which goes to the U.S.-Canadian border. With a very small population, Vermont also has relatively small cities. However, unlike New Hampshire, population centers are a bit more scattered throughout the state. Burlington, located along the shores of Lake Champlain in the northwest part of the state, has around 45,000 residents and is the smallest, largest city of any state. The city has a metropolitan population of around 215,000, a third of Vermont's total population. Other notable communities in Vermont include Rutland in the west central part of the state, Bennington in the southwest part of the state, and Brattleboro in the southeastern part of the state, and Montpelier, the capital of the state, and the smallest state capital in the U.S. with just over 8,000 residents. Like New Hampshire, Vermont is well connected with a small network of highways. I-91, which begins in New Haven, Connecticut, runs through the far eastern part of Vermont and ends at the U.S.-Canadian border. I-89, which goes through the Burlington metropolitan area, links the area to Canada and New Hampshire. And other important U.S. and state highways traverse through the state. Economically, New Hampshire and Vermont are fairly prosperous states, thanks to their high GDPs and low populations. New Hampshire has a current state GDP of $106 billion and a per capita income of $77,000 a year, placing it in the top five estates. The state's economy is diversified and includes several sectors. Historically, manufacturing has been a significant part of New Hampshire's economy. The state has a strong manufacturing base with a focus on high-tech industries, including aerospace and defense, electronics, and precision machinery. In recent years, the state has had a growing technology sector, particularly in the southern part of the state around Manchester and Nashua. Many tech companies, especially those in the software and biotechnology fields, have a presence in New Hampshire. Tourism is another crucial sector. New Hampshire attracts visitors with its natural beauty, including the White Mountains, lakes, and outdoor recreational opportunities. Ski resorts, hiking trails, and cultural attractions are major draws for tourists. Several companies are headquartered in the state, including Strum Ruger & Company, a firearms manufacturer, CNS Wholesale Grocers, one of the largest grocery suppliers in the United States, and Planet Fitness, a nationwide chain of fitness centers. Vermont also has a strong economy and has a GDP of around $41 billion and a per capita income of $64,000 a year, in the upper tier of rankings for states. Vermont has diversified their economy in the last century and has several sectors. Vermont has a small but vibrant manufacturing sector. This includes the production of machinery, electronics, and aerospace components. The state is also home to various artisanal and craft industries. Tourism is a crucial component of Vermont's economy. The state's pretty landscapes, outdoor recreational opportunities, and charming small towns attract visitors throughout the year. Skiing, Hiking and full foliage tours are popular attractions. Agriculture has historically been important in Vermont. Dairy farming in particular has played a significant role in the state's economy. Vermont is known for its high-quality dairy products, including cheese and other dairy products associated with things like ice cream. In terms of companies, Vermont is home to many headquarters, including Ben & Jerry's Ice Cream, a very well-known ice cream company, Keurig Dr. Pepper, the maker of Dr. Pepper Soda, Cura Coffee Machines, and Green Mountain Coffee Roasters, Burton Snowboards, a maker of snowboards and other winter gear, and Vermont Teddy Bear Company, a company specializing in handcrafted teddy bears. 
On to geopolitics, both New Hampshire and Vermont have complicated political histories. Initially, both states were Republican strongholds on account of their history of abolitionism, but in recent decades, both states have changed. In every election from 1860 to 1912, New Hampshire voted a Republican presidential candidate into office. This changed in the 1912 election when New Hampshire gave its electoral votes to Wilger Wilson, and again in 1916. Since then, the state voted back and forth between Republican and Democratic candidates, more so Republican. But in 1992, there was a shift as New Hampshire began electing Democratic candidates with Bill Clinton in 1992. In the last 30 years, 2000 was the only year where New Hampshire's electoral votes went to a Republican candidate, George W. Bush. In terms of the U.S. Senate, New Hampshire has two Democrats, Jean Shaheen and Maggie Hassan, and the House of Representatives statewide is represented by Democrats. Despite this, New Hampshire is seen as having strong libertarian leanings, and the state has a Republican governor, Chris Sununu, along with a Republican-led Senate and House. In terms of its libertarian political culture, New Hampshire has no state income tax, the only one in the Northeast without it, along with a strong regard for the Second Amendment and gun ownership. With that being said, New Hampshire is known for the New Hampshire primary, the first federally held primary election for Democratic and Republican prospective presidential candidates. And, in recent years, New Hampshire is regarded as being a potential swing state. Vermont also has an intricate political history. From 1860 to 1960, a 100-year period, Vermont voted for all Republican presidential candidates. This was finally broken in 1964 when the state elected Democrat Lyndon Johnson, but by 1968, it went back to voting for Republican Richard Nixon. For another 24 years, Vermont voted for Republican candidates, and then in 1992, the state voted for Democrat Bill Clinton. This election effectively turned the state blue, and it has voted exclusively for Democratic presidential candidates since then. In terms of the U.S. Senate, Vermont has one Democratic senator, Peter Welsh, and one independent, Bernie Sanders. However, Sanders is considered a Democratic Socialist and votes for Democratic causes in Congress, although he is seen as a non-establishment candidate compared to mainstream Democrats. With the state government, Vermont does have a Republican governor, Phil Scott, but its Senate and House are run by Democrats. And, unlike New Hampshire, Vermont isn't very libertarian, but is seen as more progressive in Democratic social causes. In the Northeast, both New Hampshire and Vermont are unique compared to the other states in the region. They both have their own distinctive histories, cultures, and identities. Also, while close and bordering each other, they're both considerably different states. If you had to choose one of the states to live in, which one would you pick? I'd love to hear your opinion, so please leave it in the comment section below. Thank you again for watching this week's episode. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you like geography and earth science content, please subscribe to my channel, Our World, Our Planet, Our Home. Until next time!